Good morning, everybody. Sorry about the delay. We are having a little bit of trouble with um, Roxy's uh, webcam, so we may or may not get to see her, uh, see her and Ian uh, on this, but you'll certainly get to hear their uh, vocals and their PowerPoint. Um, I'm Sean Morford. Most people who have been on these webinars a few times have seen me as the moderator. I'll be sort of the air traffic control through the through the hour we're together. I want to welcome everybody here. Um, these uh, webinars are brought to you by the Oregon Conservation Partnership. I'm with the network of Oregon Watershed Councils, but we have SWCDs on the call, um, land trusts, there's a couple of land trusts, and certainly watershed councils. And I see there's a few other partners, and um, other partners are always welcome to be part of these uh, webinars. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping things for us. We have uh, 27 of you on the call today, which we're really thrilled to have that many folks interested in the topic. Um, and there's, everybody's muted by default. And if you want to have your voice heard, there's a couple of different ways. One is you can just type a question into your little question box, and I'll be monitoring those, and I'll interrupt the presenters um, at a moment where it seems appropriate for that. And uh, the other way is if you raise your little icon hand, I'll be watching for those as well, and then I will unmute you and let you ask your question verbally. So once again, you can type your question in the question box or um, raise your little icon hand, and I'll be watching. There are two handouts for this webinar that you can download at any time. Both of them are the PowerPoints that Ian and Roxy are going to be referring to. So feel free to, to download those now or later. I will be posting them on the Network of Oregon Watershed Council's website after the presentation along with the recording for, um, for the webinar. So you can pass the link along if there's somebody who you wanted to have be here but, but couldn't, we will have this recorded as we do with all of our webinars. Um, this is a monthly webinar series. And we typically do them on the third Thursday, but we had a little bit of a, an OWEB deadline uh, the day before yesterday, so we wanted to delay this one a little bit. And um, we have another one coming up in two weeks' time on Tidegate. So on November 14th, Mel Dunn from the Coquille Watershed Association, who is a representative of the Network of Oregon Watershed Councils on the Tidegate Steering Committee, is going to be giving an update on her work and the work of the steering committee. So that's Thursday, November 14th at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And if you want to get information on that and you don't already get our mailings, when we, you, when we end, the end the webinar, there'll be a survey. You can just type your uh, email address in there and we'll make sure you get on it. Um, today's webinar is uh, a result of a conversation I had with Roxy Nair from DEQ. Uh, Roxy, you may remember, was you know, involved in a webinar in May, and she's now shifted to a new position, which is a, the State Integrated Water Resources uh, Specialist for DEQ in Portland. And when uh, shortly after she started in her position, she became aware of the fact that the state revolving fund um, was being used in a really innovative way by the Clackamas SWCD. And she wondered if folks might not be aware uh, of how all this could be used. So we decided to, to put together this, um, this session today. And um, uh, sorry, I'm just getting calls on my phone here. Um, we put this session together today and uh, and invite the Clackamas SWCD to tell their story. So Ian Raines is here um, from the Clackamas SWCD. She's the Conservation Investments Coordinator, and she's going to be doing some storytelling for us today. Um, so I'm, I think with that, I have covered all of my housekeeping stuff, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, Roxy, to get us started, you'll probably want to maximize your PowerPoint um, so we can see it. And I'm just going to get started. Great. 
Thank you, Sean. Thanks for that great introduction. Hi, everybody, and thank you for calling in today and listening to our presentation about loaning to landowners. Um, so what we're planning on doing today is that I am going to give you a very brief presentation on the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, and then Ian is going to talk more about what Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District has been doing with the local community loan. Um, but to get started, we thought we would warm you all up with a poll question. Sean? Yep, just a second. <laughs> okay. People are voting. Looks like most people are are getting their answers in. Okay, so um, looks like 100% of you have answered, 71% yes, 18% no, Roxy, and 12% said they weren't sure. Cool. Okay, great. Um, so that means hopefully everyone will learn something new today. Um, okay. Forgive me if there's technical difficulties. Let me know if my screen is not sharing properly. Um, so as e uh, Sean mentioned, sorry, as Sean mentioned, I am an integrated water resource specialist at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. So I'm not actually in the state revolving fund program. Uh, so my goal is to provide a very high level overview of the program. Unfortunately, none of the SRF staff were able to attend today, so I volunteered to do this portion of the talk. Um, but because I'm not in the program, I want to be very careful about what information I share. So if anybody has any specific questions about loans or parameters or anything like that, I have some staff contact information available so we can route you to one of the project officers. But with that, I wanted to give you an overview of what is the state revolving fund, who's eligible for these dollars, and what kind of loan types we have available with a focus on the local community loan. So the state revolving fund, what is it? In short, it is a low interest low pro loan program that is used to fund water quality improvement and protection projects. It's a program that's funded by the EPA, but it's administered by DEQ. It was created in 1987 during the Clean Water Act Amendment. And what it does is it provides a below market rate loan for projects, including planning and design, construction, and other water quality related improvement and protection projects. So far, uh, DEQ has lent a billion dollars, give or take, to 149 communities and organizations in the state since 1990. And in reserve right now, there are millions of dollars available, and a lot of that is for local community loans. So poll question number two, before I get started really talking about the state revolving fund. Okay, looks like most people are done, and it looks like the vast majority of folks have not. About 70% have not, uh, about 13% have, and uh, about 20% aren't sure. Great. All right, that's really good to know. Um, so the State Revolving Fund loan money is eligible to a certain subset of uh, public agencies or partners. Um, public agencies include cities, counties, tribes, and then special districts like irrigation districts, soil and water conservation districts, and sanitary districts. Um, and there are a lot of options in the way that there's a lot of options for water quality and protection improvement projects. There's also a lot of loan options to help support them. We have loan streams, I guess you'd call them, for planning, for point source pollution projects, non-point source pollution projects. There's a sponsorship option, and then the local community loan. 
Uh, loan terms vary depending on the loan type, um, so interest rates, repayment periods, all of that kind of depends on which loan you're eligible for. And so that would be a really good reason if you have a project idea to speak with a project officer in the program pretty early in your planning process just to find out what exactly you would be eligible for. Um, one maybe perk that the program wanted me to let everyone know about that there are options for certain projects to qualify for limited principal forgiveness. So something to keep in mind. Um, and again, eligible projects really run the gamut and can include planning and design, um, wastewater facility treatment uh, upgrades, agricultural conservation projects, protection or restoration of riparian habitats. There's even a possibility of land acquisition projects that could qualify, uh, and a lot more. Um, and applications are reviewed three times a year, so you don't necessarily have to wait for a full year cycle to get an application in for consideration. And so, poll number three. Okay, it's looking like most people have not. So, looks like about 70% not and 25% yes and a few aren't sure. Great. That's really helpful to know. Um, I am part, I had been part of that 70%. Um, I had never heard of the local community loan program before until I just happened to be in a meeting where one of the project officers mentioned Clackamas Oil and Water Conservation District and the work they were doing. Um, and so this sent me down a rabbit hole. Um, and it turns out the local community loan is probably the least known and least used of the loan options. Um, but what it is, is when an eligible partner receives a state revolving fund loan to establish their own lending program. Uh, this loan type applies only to non-point source pollution control projects. And maybe one of the reasons, I'm not sure why it's not used as much, is because it is a little bit more complicated than some of the other loan types. One of the things that potential partners need to be aware of is that these loans can only be used if you have the statutory authority to take on debt and to lend. So you would need to check in your organization statutes to make sure that you have these powers to engage in borrowing and lending. But it does have the lowest interest rate of all the loan types. Right now it's at 1.79% and it's on a 10-year repayment schedule. So the local community loan, um, and what caught my ear about it, it was that the loan funds could be used to address water quality uh, projects or issues on involving water quality on private on private lands. So Clackamas Oil and Water Conservation District created a program where they were able to use SRF funding to work with private landowners on various projects. Uh, the program wants me to let everyone know that there are several million dollars kind of sitting in the local community loan pot waiting to be used. Um, and they can be used for a myriad of activities like irrigation efficiency, up, efficiency improvements and failing septic system repair projects. There's a lot of options with non-point source on ways that this money could be used to improve water quality. And so Clackamas Oil and Water Conservation District, I don't want to speak too much for them, but what I learned in my initial uh, foray into the local community loan was that they were able to set their own loan parameters and then entered into loan agreements with individual landowners. So the loan parameters included interest rates and repayment periods, and all of that was done by the district as they rolled out their program. And so that is my very high-level overview of the SRF program and local community loans. Since I'm not in the program, um, I'm hesitant to go into too much more detail, but Jennifer Kenny, who is the Outreach and Information Specialist for the program, has offered to be a point of contact for anybody listening in today. Um, she knows about the program and this presentation and has offered to speak to people and route you to the right project officer in your region if you're interested in finding out more about any of the loans. Mm -hmm. um, if you are already a few steps ahead and would like to get your application reviewed or request assistance, the link on this slide will take you to an online form where you can submit your proposal. And with that, 
this is my contact information. Um, again, I work with the Integrated Water Resource Strategy, so if you have questions about that, feel free to send them my way. If you have other water quality program related questions, feel free to contact me and I can also get you in touch with the staff that's working uh, on that question for you. And now I'm going to hand it over to Ian. Give me one second to load your presentation. Well, we could just pause for a second to, and just see oh, if there's any questions, big picture questions. Sure. Okay. Um, before Ian launches in, I'll just wait a second. See if there's any hands or any questions anybody wants to type in at this point. Okay, I'm not seeing any yet. So, Ian, uh, why don't you go ahead? Ian, again, is the Conservation Investment Coordinator for Clackamas uh, SAU City. And I'm going to hand it over to her. Good morning. Click this button, I think. So, there's my contact information up at the front of my deal here. So, we had a couple poll questions. Sean, you want to do question number four, please? Of course. Okay, it looks like. Okay, it looks like a pretty broad spectrum um, between we have both and we have neither. Um, so let me just uh, close the poll and share what I've got there. So a pretty broad spectrum. 14% say we have one, 7% uh, we have a cost share, sorry, 14% say we have a grants program, 7% say we have a cost share. 21% say we have both, and 43% say we have neither. All right. Should so, I go ahead with the next poll question, sure. Ian? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And this is just a general loan program, I think the question refers uh -huh. to. Yes. Okay, this one looks pretty easy. People uh, know right away. 92% are saying no. 80, yeah, 80 to 90% are saying no. Um, not sure. Awesome. And that, there's the results. Ian, you can't see them, but uh, no one said yes, and 86% no, and 14 weren't sure. 14% weren't sure. 14% weren't sure. Okay, thank you. So let's okay. talk a little bit about how having a loan program might be beneficial to your district or if you're a watershed council or land trust to partners who are um, public entities such as conservation districts. So to follow up on Roxy's presentation, we the, con the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District has had grant and cost share programs. We, we kind of use grant and cost share sort of the same way because in most cases the person, the landowner or land manager is putting in money or time also as their match. Sometimes we get OEB grants or other types of funds, but we've had that kind of thing for a while. But they were always on a reimbursement basis. And a lot of times the landowner couldn't afford to contribute their share up front. Um, so we developed a grant plus loan program and then also a, a straight out loan program where we're paying the bills and the landowner pays us back whatever their share would be. Sometimes if it's just simply a loan, they may be doing some, some cash and in-kind as well, but we're paying the bills to the contractor and the landowner pays us back over time and we work that out. Um, sometimes in grant plus loan situations, a lot of the things that we do are grant plus loans, some are straight out loan. But we developed our loan program independently, and then we filled out an application to DEQ for a Clean Water State Revolving Fund local community loan. It was an application process and had to be ranked and all that stuff, but we were given a loan. It's not a line of credit. It's not the kind of thing where you just draw down on the loan and then 
pay it back and the money's available again. We Our first loan was for $250,000. And once that money was spent down, it was spent down. But then we were able to, add, to ask them to add some money and develop a new loan for us. So now we have like $500,000 in a loan that um, is kind of an extension of the first loan, but it's a new loan agreement. DEQ funds are paid on a, on a reimbursement basis, so you have to incur the expenses, uh, at least a phase of the expenses um, on the project and then ask them to disperse the funds. But our first payment isn't due to them until all of the funding from DEQ has been dispersed on that loan. So the whole, for the, the $500,000 loan, we don't owe them any payments until we've already received the whole $500,000. And that might take three or four years for us to get all those loans, loan payments dispersed to us. And then we have 10 years to repay them. It's a low interest loan. Uh, there are some, there's interest, there's fees, but in many cases you can get, potentially get a partial principal forgiveness like Roxy mentioned. Our loans have 50% principal forgiveness so we say on a $500,000 loan, we pay have pay back $250,000 of it, plus the interest on that amount, plus the fees that DEQ puts on the loan. But it's re it's really pretty reasonable. The main thing is, for us, we need to have some money up front to be able to seed our program because we couldn't say, hey, look, DEQ, give us a loan so we can spend it on this project, and then we'll pay you back. It's like we had to spend the money. Then they paid us back, so there's a little bit of lag time there. Um, but it's worked out really well for us, and it, I think it could work out for a lot of districts. It's not as if you have to have a bunch of money up front to be able to make these loans, because DEQ is very timely in paying those bills back to us. So it's our program is a, a revolving loan program. Um, some of the loans we make are with district money. A lot of the loans we make are with DEQ money. So an example here is we entered into a, a loan agreement with DEQ. We made we make loans to landowners. They're repaying the they're repaying us, and then we use those repayment dollars to make more loans. So it's kind of like the same dollars used twice. We'll make a loan to somebody for twenty thousand dollars. They're paying us back over time, but we're collecting those repayments, and we're able to make use that money to pay out more loans to other landowners and eventually we have to pay back DEQ but sometimes you can use that money a few times before it because it's like after the money come, all comes to us in the disbursement so we finally have to begin paying DEQ over a 10-year period. So we have a couple kinds of loans. One is conservation practice and equipment loans. Therefore, water quality, water quantity projects on private land. All of our loans with the DEQ money have to have some kind of a water quality benefit or water conservation benefit. Um, so if it was a project that you couldn't really make a good argument, we would be using district funds for those loans. But almost all of our projects are water quality benefit, and so we're using the DEQ funds, and it's been working really well for us. The other part of our conservation practice and equipment loan program is the purchase of conservation related equipment. So some examples are irrigation efficiency improvements, livestock heavy use areas, manure management. We've also done, not using the DEQ money at this point, but we've done bridge loans for equip projects where a landowner wanted to say buy the kit to make, to in, construct a high tunnel hoop house, but they didn't have the money to buy the kit. So we paid for the kit and then they paid us back as soon as they, the kit was installed and they got their equip money. That's not something we've done with the DEQ loan money yet, but we could do that. And then we've also lent on a couple of pieces of equipment that have water quality benefits, paying the dealer directly. With our conservation practice loans, the conservation plan is required with either the district or NRCS. All of the projects are landowner driven we're not telling them they have to do it. It's a kind of project they would want to do, and they pick the contractor and all that stuff, work with our planners or NRCS planner. Like I said, all the DEQ-funded loans need to have a water quality benefit because that's the whole purpose of the DEQ Clean Water State Revolving 
fund local community loans to have that kind of benefit. We pay the contractor, suppliers, equipment dealers directly. We do not pay the landowner directly. So there's no question in risk management land, there's no question that we're going to make a loan to a landowner, then they're going to use that money to go pay their truck off. No, they're going to use it on this project, and we're paying the contractors and suppliers and dealers directly. The loan and the payment plan, we write each of those individually. We have a template, but every loan is customized for the landowner. We've had landowners who have who make annual payments when their berry crop comes in. When, because all of their money comes in the fall or the summer, and so it doesn't make sense for them to try to make monthly payments. We have other people who make monthly payments. We have a couple of people who make payments twice a year. Uh, it's often used in combination with grant or cost share or potentially with an equip contract, and sometimes they're standalone, just plain loan, and the landowner may or may not be putting in additional cash or labor and we only use a promissory note from the landowner. We don't, in our district, we don't ask for a lot of collateral or a lot of paperwork. You know, they make a loan agreement with us and a promissory note has enough teeth in it that we don't have to worry about um, going to collect on collateral and that kind of thing. And everybody has paid off their loans either on time or early. And all of our borrowers are currently doing a great job. We just send them a reminder, or they send us the check. It all works out really well. We also have a program for residential septic system repair loans. That's a different loan from DEQ, but it's in the same program. It's a local community loan. Our loan is for $250,000. Um, it's for the repair or replacement of existing failed or failing residential septic systems. It's in a limited geographic area because there's a part of our, there's a watershed in our county that has a lot of old septic systems, a lot of soils that are vulnerable to um, transporting pollution if the septic system were to fail. And all of the people are having issues with, all of the people who come to us for a loan and get a loan are having issues with, it's a bad system, it really needs to be replaced. We have to rely heavily on our partners because uh, the district does not, it's septic system stuff is not our area of expertise. So we partner with the county septic and on-site wastewater program and with a local water providing agency that does outreach for us. Ian? Most of the Yes, I'm sorry. We've got, we've got a question. Um, oh, sorry. Whether that, that's okay. I can read the question to you. Okay. Um, cool. Awesome. Is it the is it the district or the landowner who pays the contractors, suppliers, equipment dealers directly? Who who is lining up those contracts with the contractor, suppliers, equipment dealer? The district or the landowner? So, in all of our programs, we recommend that people get bids get three bids from contractors and suppliers or but you don't necessarily have to you know you have to find the supplier or the contractor that's going to be the most responsive and and be able to be available to do the job the district is paying those people directly and then the landowner pays us back whatever the amount of the loan is so we might have a project that's a $50,000 project we pay the contractor $50,000, the landowner's share is to pay us back 25000 of that, and the district share is to have 25000 of that as grant or cost share from the district. But instead of having the landowner pay part and we pay part, we have a, in our budget it shows, you know, it's a line item budget that shows what we're going to pay for and what our limits are and what the landowner is expected to pay for. So sometimes it's a project where it's going to cost more than our loan. I mean, usually, a lot of times it is. Probably almost every time the cost of the project is greater than our loan. So the landowner is going to pay some money out too. But we'll pay out, that's a good question, we'll pay out the bill up to our limit. We've had some irrigation projects that cost more than the loan amount. And so, like, we would pay 
the supplier up to our loan amount and the landowner would pay the rest of it. Because uh, we kind of have some limits too. We on some of these bigger projects, we can't pay 100%. But the loan amount is where we're paying it out and they're paying us back, not where they're paying it out and we're saying, okay, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a combination. Okay. Thank, thanks, Ian. Um, Susan, it's kind of like. Been, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say in the septic one, it's that I'm going to talk about here in a second. It's uh, usually we're paying out 100% of the cost. But in the other ones, a lot of times there's landowner share and there's grants and there's loans, and the loan is not going to be 100% of the cost. So it's a combination of your money and our money, landowner. Okay, thank you. Susan, you can let us know whether that answered your question or not. Th thanks, Ian. Figure out how to make this so that we can see the question. Because I've got the, the thing is on the screen, I can't see the questions. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's my job as the moderators to help you know what questions are being asked. So go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so now what do I click? Okay. This one? Okay. All right. That all makes sense, guys. There's a lot of conservation practices that people want to do, and they just can't afford to do them. And but they could afford to do it if they just had some cash flow. So that's kind of what that's about. With the septic repair loans, a lot of these folks are in a bind where they've got a failed system, and there's they really can't afford. It's it's like it's an emergency situation where they they have to fix this system. It's not really a matter of choice where, oh, well, we'll put in our heavy use area next year or I'll buy that piece of equipment next year. It's like it's got to be done. So a lot of those folks are not working with the district. They come to us because they've heard of our loan program. They're not already like a cooperator with the district or NRCS. So a lot of, a lot of the folks in the septic loan Avenue come to us from partners like the county septic office or the water provider office or the contractors will say, I've got a person here and I know you guys have a loan program. They might be interested in getting a loan. The county is providing the oversight and the inspection of the work because that's not something that we do. You know, in the other regular loans, we, the district or NRCS is doing all the inspection of the work and managing the project and stuff, but in this case, it's the counties doing that. We took the step of getting pre-qualified contractors. We sent out an announcement to contractors all over the area who do septic work and wanted to have a list of pre-qualified contractors that have agreed that they will work with the district as far as they understand that the district would pay them directly instead of them having to wait for the landowner to come up with the money to pay them. We wanted to make sure that the land, the contractors, since we don't know a lot about this stuff, that they are like real contractors who really know what they're doing, not a fly-by-night contractor who says, oh yeah, I'm going to give me half the money up front. I'll go out and buy the pipe and get the system and all this stuff and I'll put it in for you and I'll be back. And then it's like they've taken off. That's kind of happens sometimes with septic contractors or so-called septic contractors. So we got a lot of guidance from our county septic office and um, came up with a list of pre-qualified contractors, the folks who applied to become a member of that list. It's the landowner's decision who to choose from that list, but they need to choose somebody from that list because we already know that they're going to be willing to work with us as far as the payment and we're going to have a relationship as far as um, working with the landowner and the county and all that kind of stuff. We pay the contractor. We don't pay the landowner. On a few occasions, it might be that the landowner's loan amount also includes the permit, and they may have already paid for the permit, so we can reimburse them for that. But generally speaking, we're only paying the contractor. 
The loan and payment plan, again, is customized for the homeowner. We have additional loan security that's required because these, um, there's a need, but the district kind of thought there was a need to put a lien on the title of the property so that if the homeowner sells the home or refinances the home or they the home changes hands, we would be on the list of creditors that would get paid back because we weren't sure how things are all going to work. Um, since this is a kind of area of, of, that we weren't real familiar with. It's worked out really well so far. Um, we also have um, a 10-year loan repayment period that we'll give folks because some of these loans are pretty you know, like $25,000, and when you really don't have a lot of money to be able to pay, pay for the work and you need the upfront money through the loan, we wanted to make sure to give people the ability to have some reasonable payments back to us. And so we work, every, every loan is worked out with that landowner to see how their payments might work for them. Any questions about the septic before I get into, I guess I could, I could click back, I could click back, so. So the septic loans are a little bit of a different thing because there's a great need in our county, particularly in that watershed that has all the old systems. But it's a little bit different in the sense that we're not typically working with them and have already have a relationship with landowners because they would have done a conservation plan with us. Questions about septic at all? I'm not seeing any come in, Ian. Okay. okay. So to date, uh, the Conservation District has made loans of over $333,000 to landowners. Irrigation loans are a big part of that. They're expensive projects typically. Um, and the landowners putting in money in addition to us putting in money We've had nine irrigation loans. We've had three loans for other practices like heavy use areas and riparian fencing and um, manure composting stuff. A couple loans for conservation equipment and a couple loans so far for residential septic system repairs. I'm gonna show you a few photos, go through them pretty fast so that we can make sure we have time for discussion of irrigation improvements and then a sprayer that we purchased or helped a landowner purchase. The other thing to know is that the landowner owns all the stuff. So the landowner owns the equipment, the landowner owns the irrigation system, the landowner owns the septic system. We're not owners of any of that. We're just financing it and making a reasonable, a reasonable arrangement so they can afford to do the practice. So we would like to see them do anyway, but they wouldn't be able to do it without some kind of a loan. So here's a caneberry operation with overhead irrigation in the background that was wasting a lot of water uh, and causing a lot of impact to the soil and was using a lot of electricity. Here's that same operation during the kind of the final stages of installation. We did a main line and distribution lines and then uh, install drip lines to the berry rows. So it's targeting the root zones a lot better for the soil and the, you know, the berries are very healthy. There's not a lot of waste of water. Here's a nursery, a tree and shrub nursery using overhead irrigation. You can see that that's puddling up. There's a lot of over application and non-uniform application of the water runoff and soil erosion resulting. Here's that same place after. And with nurseries, they take the crop out. So it's there's some little baby nursery little seedlings in there. You can see that now the water is being directed to the roots and not all over the landscape. And he's only using about 20% of the water that they were using before. Here's a hazelnut orchard, same kind of deal. He was spraying with hand lines, um, and now he's only using about 20 to 30 percent of the water he was using before. Some 
uh, some of the components of an irrigation system, a filter station that enhances efficiency and extends the life of the system by filtering out impurities. Fertigation chemigation system at that nursery, reducing the use of fertilizers and chemicals. Fish screen. Am I going too fast on these slides? I'm just trying to give you time to read the caption. This is one of good. our, we have a, a couple of our hazelnut guys are irrigating from a stream that's a fish, a salmon bearing stream. And so there's a fish screen that's installed to make sure the little fish don't get sucked up into the pipe. That would kind of not be good. We do a lot of integrate, in, integrated water management. Um, here's a data logger for soil moisture sensors. This meter. Here's a sprayer that a grape, wine grape vineyard purchased. They had a sprayer that was a lot less efficient than this one. This one can do two rows in one pass, so it saves fuel and reduces soil compaction. It's got those upper nozzles that are directed at the upper parts of the vine, so they can really reduce their use of chemicals and way reduce the drift that would have gone off, you know, drift of chemicals due to wind. And then the lower nozzles um, direct to the lower part of the vine, and all of this reduces con contamination of soil and waterways because they're not spraying herbicide and fungicide and stuff everywhere. So I think that the DEQ Clean Water State Revolving Loan, State Revolving Fund Local Community Loans Program really can be a great source of funding for conservation districts and irrigation districts and other public entities to get conservation work done on the ground. Questions. Yeah. And then there's here's our little district address and contact information and stuff. Great, Ian. Thank you so much. I've got a couple of questions. Um, how long have you been doing the loan program in the uh, in Clackamas County? Let me tell you that we. We started our loan program in fiscal year 2011-2012, and we got the DEQ money the following year. So we've been doing this. Our first loan was an equipment loan, a $45,000 loan for a no-till drill. And that's since 2012-2013. Um, so like over six years, right? Five, six years? Okay. And far and away, most of our loans are made with this DEQ money. Great. I've got a question from Kelly Hamby. I'm just going to, she's raised her hand, so I'm going to unmute you, Kelly, and I think we can hear you. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I think she's written her question out. Is there an in-stream requirement? An in-stream requirement. Um, Kelly, you're um, unmuted if you want to just ask your question. We can't hear you if you're trying to talk to us. Sean, Sorry, we're not getting you. Oh. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Rob. That's a really good I think that's a really good question for the SRF program. So Kelly, I am going to send that question over to them. I'm curious as well. And I will connect all of you via email as well so that Jenny or one of the project officers can answer that question. Okay. She followed up with saying, meaning is the conserved water required to be returned to the river source? Ooh. Oh, that's the OWRD, the Oregon Water Resource Department. Uh, that would be under their authority. I believe there is an element of that, but I would need to double check. I think we have one of our irrigators who's doing that, but I'm not. I'm not sure how that works for the rest of them. 
Okay, so we'll take note of that question and, and I'll send out a response to all the registrants on the call so you can get the response. Um, okay, another question. Uh, how do they, uh, how do they pay for loan program management? Uh, oh yeah, how do you guys pay for the loan program management? Tax base, capacity grant? What? I think that's for you, Ian. Yeah, we're one of, we're one of the conservation districts that has a tax base. So, um, it's just part of our regular personnel costs. We don't, Charge any kind of administrative fee. I don't even. We don't even charge like an application fee to the borrowers, the local borrowers. Um, we charge a little bit of interest, but it's it all goes back into the fund. We created a loan fund. We have a grant and cost share fund, and then we have a loan fund. But all of the management, all the staff work, it just comes out of the general fund, like Mike's salary and our fiscal guy's salary and stuff. So that'd be tax-based money. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tracy, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to free to ask. Um, Ian, do you know, if are there any other SWCDs doing this? Or are you guys the only ones? I'm not do aware you know? of any. I'm not aware of any. I think we're the only ones. Okay. okay. Do you have a sense of what the barriers to launching into this might be that 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 you would give any advice to any districts that are considering this. Well, part of it is what does your you know a, a board member of a conservation district might have a concern about are we going to get paid back. Are we going to be making loans for stuff that doesn't get done or that doesn't get done properly? How do we make sure that we manage whatever risk there would be in this loan that we're going to make to somebody? And I would answer that by we at Clackamas have a a well-written loan agreement. There's a cooperative agreement about the project and then a loan agreement related to the payment plan and the interest rate and all that stuff. And our agreements include the fact that if you don't install this properly, you know, or if, if the project is not installed properly, you're still on the hook for the loan. And I mean, we, we do the, so many of them are grant and loan combination, but we manage the risk by saying that the landowner is responsible for costs if the project is not properly installed and passes the inspection, or if the landowner doesn't use the practice or use the equipment in a manner that's consistent with our agreement. Like if we pay for a manure composting facility and they decide to park their tractor in one of the bays and never use that bay, it's a three bay manure shed and be like, dude, <laughs> no, it's not, no, 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 you're not using it properly. So, so we have those kinds of things in our agreement that, that gives us some recourse if the landowner doesn't do the project right. We have the same kind of things in our grant agreements and cost share agreements as well. Um, we have a promissory note, and the reason that we have a promissory note instead of some kind of a filing or collateral kind of thing is that the promissory note that says they're re they're going to pay us back and we have recourse if they don't, and we'll work out something with them if they need an extension, but we're still going to need our money back, is a friendlier way to do things. And it still ensures as much as anything can that we're going to get paid back. Um, there's no way we're going to be ripping out somebody's irrigation pipe, calling the irrigation system the collateral, and then you don't pay the loan, we're going to rip it out. Uh, we talked about at our district about when we do equipment loans, well, what if they just up and sell the equipment? You know, let's can we get like a UCC filing on it so that we can make sure that we're notified if they try to sell the equipment so we can go get it because we don't want them selling it or they have to give us the money. 
a UCC filing doesn't have any relationship. I mean, there's no guarantee that we're ever going to know that they're going off to the Woodburn auction and selling off that no-till drill or whatever it is we bought, or they bought with our money. So it really didn't do any good to try to do some kind of a, there's no title, there's no license plate on a sprayer or a whatever piece of equipment they're going to buy. So we went the route of the promissory note, and that's worked out really well for us, and it just kind of feels friendlier. Yeah, you've got three more questions that have okay. come in. Uh, oh, sorry. So that's okay. So um, does the Clackamas staff or board have a special expertise dealing with loans, and do you, um, or do you uh, outsource the work of the loans and repayment? We one of them. learned ourselves. We we consulted with some folks who know some stuff about loans, and we have a financial guy who is involved in tracking the loans and stuff, as I do as well. We don't have any particular expertise related to loans. We thought at first about having somebody, some other outfit, handle the loan payment thing for us. It was like, what? Well, this is not necessary. So we just kind of organically learned how to do it, and had our assistance from our attorney in writing up the agreements and stuff. They kind of have to look me in the eye and shake my hand and say they're going to pay the loan back. It's kind of, and then we sign here, <laughs> sign this, sign that. But it's, it works out well. Yeah. Okay, l last question then, at, at least right for right now, Ian, um, is about default rate. So what's the default rate on loans that for individuals and if you or do you use the principal forgiveness aspect to ameliorate the cost for your defaults? And if you don't quite understand that whole contact, yeah. Jim, Cath Jim Cathcart, I'm going to unmute you and let you talk. But maybe go ahead and address it if you understand the, the question, Ian, and we'll see if we can answer Jim's question. I think I, I think I get what you, what you mean, but if you want to... You want to expound on that a little bit, Jim, or should I just answer? I've just unmuted you, Jim, if you want to say anything. Go ahead, Ian. Okay. The default rate is zero. Everybody's paid their loans. Now, we have had a couple people. There was one of our small farmers who got an irrigation loan that had some uh, family illness kind of stuff going on, and they needed. To, they asked if they could have a few months off of making payments. We, I talked with our my manager. I talked with our financial guy, and was like, "Yeah, no problem. What do you What do you need?" It's like we're, we're all of these folks. We're already we're working with in one way or another. We've designed their system, or we're working with them on their installation of their manure shed or whatever. So it was like. We're very compassionate. You know, it's really it's really interesting because we don't ask for credit ratings. We don't ask for I-9s and W-2s and W-4s and the last five years year taxes. We say, you're going to pay us back. Yeah. Okay. So what do you need? And it's it's worked out great. We had every – most of the producers have paid off the loans on – some of them have paid it off early because they're producers and they get all their money for their hazelnuts in the fall and they it was like, you know what, I can afford to just pay this loan off. It's like, fine, because you guess what? You save interest. If you pay your loan off early, you save interest. If you make bigger payments than your your um, minimum payment, you're paying it. We put that toward the principal and you're going to eventually pay your loan off early and any loan, any interest you would have owned us, we just forgive it at that point. The septic people, we've had one of those folks who asked if they could have start their payments a couple minutes later than they planned on. It's like, consult with my manager, consult. Yep, yeah, okay, no problem. You know, we've got the principal forgiveness stuff we have not passed along. We have really low interest rates. Generally, it's like 3% for all of the conservation practices and equipment. Uh, we have kind of a matrix of how it works for the um, septic loans. And we have a hardship provision for septic loans because we do get this 50% principal forgiveness on our septic loans also. We 
asked the board if we could build in a parameter that says if the person totally just they just are they're not going to be able to pay this loan even if we give them 10 years they're limited income they're on retirement so they're under social security or they have no income or just different stuff you know write me a letter that says you can't you're on limited income and you can't afford to pay the loan and we'll defer your payments so then at the time that you're that you're property changes hands or that you sell the property or refinance at that point you have to pay us back but so I've got one of our septic people that's like she's not going to make any payments at all until that such time comes or her estate she's she's kind of elderly when her estate goes into the next level you know when she passes away we'll get paid off at that point one piece of advice I guess would be don't lend out any more money than you can afford to not get back. But if you're working with your people and you're in in a relationship with them on a conservation plan or you're at least in contact with them about their payments and how's it going and how's your system working for you and stuff, they're going to want to pay you back because they people don't want to come and ask for a loan. But if they can go to a friendly lender that's not going to make them go through a whole bunch of inordinate hoops like we don't make them do that it just feels really comfortable in most cases i think mm -hmm. okay well that brings us up to the 11 o'clock hour i don't see any more questions that came in but uh folks can call you at the district office is that right ian for more questions yep yeah and my, Roxy, my direct line is my my direct line is on the first page of my thing, and then the district office is on the last page. Yes, please do call or email. We'll be happy to okay. talk to you and share information. Right. And Roxy? Super interesting. Uh, it just absolutely spans uh, the work that everybody is doing into a whole new realm. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us. And just as a reminder, we will post this uh, on the network uh, website along with your, your two PowerPoints. And I'm just going to leave it there. And thank you, everybody, for, for being part of the session today. Don't forget about November 14th, uh, hearing about Tidegate. It's an, an important topic for everybody, even across the state, to, to know about. So once again, Roxy, Ian, really appreciate you taking the time to prepare this and, and share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.